Amen. You know, um, last week, uh, Josh spoke. And this week, I get the privilege of speaking. <clears throat> no, I know what some of you are thinking right now. I did not text Josh last night and say, hey, I'm going to wear a green short sleeve shirt. <laughs> wear one too. We did not plan it. It just happened. Uh, but I also uh, want to give you a heads up. <clears throat> this morning as I was, as I'm preparing this and reading over it, this is not my natural lean. Uh, I have the opportunity, I'm a, I always look at it as an opportunity, but the opportunity uh, to cover the do nots to one another. So if, uh, if you feel like um, you're, you're getting a talking to by your dad, I'm sorry. Um, I'll try to be gentle. Uh, so, uh, how many, how many parents we got in the room? A, a good handful. Yeah, yeah. Way to go, moms and dads. Way to go. I'm sure that all of you, at one point in time, have said something to the effect of this. Stop. Don't do that. No, don't, don't lick the window, please. No, stop touching every surface in Costco, please. Anyone else? Just me? Just me? Yeah, so we're, we're as parents, man, we, we, I feel like sometimes it's stop and do not. Don't stop that. Please stop. Please stop that. Are all like right there together, right? Um, and it really gets serious when we get to the middle name drop. Amen? When you middle name drop it, it's, it's like, okay, as a child, I knew when I heard my middle name, I should probably cut it out because things are about to get serious. Okay, at this point, everything's been like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. The moment that I hear my middle name, I, I, I need to realize that I'm walking on thin ice, and I'm a big guy, okay? So uh, my second grade parent-teacher conference is a moment that stands out in my mind as I'm preparing for this. And uh, my mom and dad come, and they're talking about my grades and, you know, how social I am in class and how much fun I am to be a student and have this teacher, you know. And, and my second grade teacher got something that no other teacher had ever received. And that was the opportunity to use my middle name. <laughs> Not only just my middle name, <clears throat> it went to the full name, you know. Not the nickname name that you go by that everybody calls you, you know, hey, Jeremy, what's up? No, no. She got Jeremiah, David, you need to listen. And she used it in about that tone. And have you ever, like, had a teacher that's like, hey, so, Scott, you're going to go to the principal's office now. You know, just the sweetest tone, but, like, your life is over when you get home. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the belt is coming off, and you're going you're gonna to realize the authority that Jesus gave your father, you know? Like, that's that, that's that moment. Jeremiah, David, you need to stop. So listen, this is going to feel kind of like one of those messages. Honestly, I really wanted to, uh, to try to, like, rock, paper, scissors for Josh's encouragement one last week. But it just didn't work out. So here I am uh, giving you the message that hits where it hurts. Um, but this is the thing that we know that scripture is our authority as Christ followers. And even the pieces that hurt me are still authoritative in my life. Even the pieces that, I, that are hard to hear, that are maybe bitter to go down, I need to recognize I've got to line my life up with this because it's not my authority, it's not my way, it's the Lord's way. And my life as a Christ follower, as an ambassador of his, needs to look like scripture. Not like what the world wants it to look like or accepts it to look like, but as Scripture says, 
what Scripture teaches us. So we continue today in this One Another series, remembering, again, that the heart of this series is to call us to love one another. John 13, 34 through 35 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. You must love one so so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's a lot of loving one another. You know what I mean? But but Jesus is saying, You belong to me now. Now make it known to the world. By the way you fellowship, by the way you live, by the way you parent, by the way you do marriage, by the way you love your spouse, show how you love one another to the world how you love your neighbor. You know, I almost, uh, I almost, I have a, uh, a red cardigan and I thought, oh, I could throw on the little red cardigan and just, won't you be my neighbor? <laughs> but I thought, no, no, that would work in kids' church. Don't know how to go here. So, <laughs> see, the thing is, this, this loving one another thing is not about fitting into my neighborhood and fitting into culture or making sure people know that I'm a good person. That's not what loving one another is about. What loving one another is about is, is being different than this world. So how many of you guys know that normal is not working? Like cultural norms from when I was a child to now are completely two different things. Like we would have laughed at hearing that in 2024, some of the things that happen, happen. We would have laughed at it and probably made fun of it. Some of us still do. But this is not about fitting into culture. This is not about fitting into my community, necessarily. This is more so a matter of a new way to live. That God has made us available, that God has made available to us the tools in which to empower us to do this. Right? First of all, it's the authority of Scripture. Some of you will notice that in your notes, there's actually a spot with page numbers, just for you students, for the ESV Student Study Bible. Because that's like, uh, that's one of our, our core values as a student ministry is that we teach our students that scripture is our answer. That when we're looking for what to do or how do we handle this situation, we go to scripture first. Because uh, scripture teaches us what to do and how to act. And uh, Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Secondly, Jesus uh, gave us the spirit-filled life. He left, he said, it's better for me to go so that I can leave the helper, so that my father will send the helper. He had to go. It says, and I will ask the father in John 14, 16 through 17, and I'll ask the father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And then, so he's given us the authority of scripture, he's given us the spirit-filled life, and he's given us biblical community. And Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. So today, we're going to look at some scriptures uh, that were written to various groups of believers. Because many of the scriptures that, we're, that I'm going to be reading today uh, were from uh, pastoral leadership, spiritual leadership, to the body of believers, okay? So we're going to be looking, though, and the overarching theme within these letters is that false teachers were infiltrating the church, and they are hearing false teachings and being divided that they're disagreeing with one another. There's something breaking the unity the Lord desires for his bride. So today we're going to start with the end in mind with this question. Is what causes fights and quarrels among you? What causes fights and quarrels among you? Isn't that like the number one question that parents ask when there's an altercation? Is like, okay, what caused this? I know I did that this morning. You know what I mean? Like, hey, why are you guys fighting? What's going on? Why are you guys arguing right now? You're trying to figure out the root of the issue. So what I want to do is we're going to walk through some of the symptoms 
but not really the root. And then we're going to get to the end with the root issue. Okay? So let's dive into this. One of the first symptoms that we look at is in Corinthians 3. And we see that Paul is telling the believers in Colossae to not lie. Right? How many of you guys know that lying is never a good way to live your life? Right? Like, because the problem is, is that if you tell this lie, but then you tell this lie, and then you tell this lie, and then I don't know about you, but I get about two minutes in, and I'm like, I can't remember what I just said. Like, I can't remember what I said I'm having for dinner, let alone something I lied about. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. Are we having tomatoes or tacos? I don't, I don't know. Are we having salsa? Salsa with tacos? No? Guacamole? I don't know. Anyways, I've had a lot of Mexican this weekend. So... Um, so Paul writes to the believers in Colossians, Colossae, believers here, uh, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We are to be truthful in all areas of life. Lying to one another, once again, disrupts the unity by destroying trust, right? How many of you parents have had a kid and you've seen something, you're like, okay, who did that? Who did that? Parents, am I the only one who has kids doing things? And I'm like, I'm trying to figure out who did that. And all of a sudden, nope, no one did it. It was cast with a friendly ghost. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like, guys, who took the stickers and stuck them in the shower wall? Who did that? Oh, I don't know. I, I swear, I don't know. Who did, how did those get, I don't even know. <laughs> like, come on, bud. I may have been born at night, but it wasn't last night, all right? Like, I, you know, but here's the deal, though. When that happens, you're like, okay, yeah, sure. Your trust is degraded just a little bit, right? Like, your trust takes a hit. Like, I can trust you, but I, man, you lied about this. Like, what else are you lying about? Are you going to tell me another lie? You know what I mean? That being renewed, though, is a present tense. It's a continual thing. Okay, it indicates the transformation of Christians as Christ followers is an ongoing process. This is something that we have to do all the time. Okay? This won't end until we're raptured to be with him. But as Christ followers, we have to recognize that he has set us free. That we can live in the truth and be transparent and be honest because we know that lying and deceitfulness doesn't honor our God, right? Like, he has set us free. We no longer are ruled by our mouth, but we are ruled by a king, by a Lord. James 4, 11, this one, this one once again has to do with the mouth. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers, The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. You know, as, as, uh, as I was studying this out, man, that judgment is a really, like, hot cultural issue, right? How many of you guys have ever heard, well, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Only God can judge me heard that in Indianapolis a couple times, you know. But listen, here's the deal. Judgment ends in two ways. One way is condemnation, okay, and one way is evaluation, right? We don't judge for condemnation, but we do judge for evaluation, right? Because if you claim to be a Christ follower, but you don't look or live like a Christ follower, two and two is not equal in four here. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, like James says, faith without works is dead. Well, have you guys ever been in a room when someone has been called dead? Do they just say, well, yeah, maybe they're dead? No, it takes evaluation. It takes some judging. You get close to the situation, and you say, yeah, dude, they're dead. He gone. Like, there is an evaluation that takes place. This doesn't, and this is the other thing, too. We need to understand, this does not, prohibit rebuking those in the church who persist in unrepentant sin, okay? That's not what what James is saying here. 
Matthew 18, 15 commands that we expose and rebuke sin within the church. This is commanded. Now, it's not just commanded, though. He gives us a biblical pattern. Jesus lays out the biblical pattern in which this should happen, okay? There should be a process. Rather than speaking about another person, though, we should go and make every effort to speak to that person, right? Because if you're not speaking to them about an issue you've got, all that is is called gossip. Even if it is, well, we really need to pray for them. Well, I don't know if you've heard, but we really need to pray for them. Just stop. Just stop. All you're doing is gossiping. Okay? If you wanted to pray for them, you can do that with you and the Lord. You don't need to run your mouth about so-and-so because they got issues. You don't want people running about your issues, right? Because we all got issues. Right? Rather than speaking about another person, we should go and make effort to con- connect with them and talk about the problem or the issue that we're having with them before drawing conclusions. It's like the expectation gap. Have you guys ever heard of this? Okay, so this is what I expect, and this is where you landed, your measurement of reality, right? Like, hey, I expected you to do the dishes. Instead, you filled the sink with water. Or you let the dishes soak, right? Here's the deal. There's a gap between what happened or what what you expected and what actually happened. And we all have this. We have this in our marriages. We have this in our workplaces. We have this with our children. We have this with our coworkers. But that gap between expectation and reality What I see in scripture is that it's my job to, instead of judging them and condemning them here, is to hold my judgment and hold my thoughts and say, you know what? I'll bet she was probably just trying her best to survive with six kids running all over the place, and that's why the dishes aren't clean, right? Like, it's it's my job to assume the best, until I've got a reason to believe otherwise. It's my job to believe that another believer didn't intend to upset me, didn't intend to to hurt me. They were probably just doing what they do, and that's operating with, with the best intentions in mind. We all know that we're just trying to do our best, okay? That's, that's the assumption that I try to operate out of, is that you are trying to do your best, in whatever circumstances life threw at you, man, there's a gap here, but it's okay, because you know why? Because I'm called to help bear your burden. Because I'm called to help encourage you and to spur you on to good works. Because I'm called to love you. Because Christ first loved me. Do you guys see what I'm saying here? Do you guys see what I'm saying? We must be careful not to misrepresent another person's motives. It's not my job to go run my mouth about so-and-so because they didn't do this. Saying things that are malicious or false in any way is damaging, in any way damaging towards someone's reputation violates that call that Jesus gave us to love one another as followers of Jesus. Romans 14, 13 says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in any way of a brother. Now, again, once again, when we're talking about judging here, we're talking about judging for condemnation, not evaluation, okay? And to not put a spiritual, uh, not to put a stumbling block or a pitfall, uh, it's kind of like, it's more translated like a, a cause for offense, okay? Like, I don't want to be the reason that someone stumbles in their faith. So let me just Think of others, okay, first. Others first. We almost often always think of others. The question is, normally, we think, what faults can I find in them? How many of you uh, Facebook stalkers out there? No, no one wants to admit it? Okay, a couple of you. Right on. Thank you for your honesty. I see it. I see that hand. 
What this speaks to, though, the question is, instead of first, how, how, instead our first thought should be, how will my actions affect them? How can I best serve them? Do you see what I'm saying? It's thinking others first. It's thinking others first. James 5, 9. Oh, this is a good one. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. That almost feels like it should be in Revelation. The judge is standing at the door. See, I did some little little word looking. The word grumble there, the word grumble there, it is, uh, it's kind of grumble or groan. And it's the same word that's used in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5, 2. How many of you are familiar with this? For in this tent we groan. Everybody say groan. Groan. Longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Have you ever been around someone that you would rather be dead than have a conversation with? Like, think about that. Like, oh, here they come. You can see them walking across the parking lot. It's another chocolate bar fundraiser. It's like, oh, man. Oh, just groaning of like, man, they drain me. Oh, my gosh, I would rather die than talk to them. The motive, though, here is patience. Because, see, the judge is standing at the door. It's a reminder, man, that at any moment, he can come back. That at any moment the Lord will call us home. And the last thing that I want to do is be in the middle of quarreling or grumbling or criticizing or gossiping about another believer. That I need to watch my mouth. That sometimes, yes, there are, we do have extra grace required individuals. We all know these people. Okay, and if you don't, you might be one. And we love you. We love you very much. And we pray every day for more grace for you. Okay, thank you for praying for me. Here's the deal, though, man. James doesn't want bitterness. He doesn't want us to be filled with resentment for one another. That, man, I can't stand you. I'd rather die than talk to you. When in reality, the Lord has put us in community that we could walk arm in arm with one another that we could help and serve one another. But that's, that's, that's what biblical community is. You look back at Acts 2, there were no needs among them because they all took care of one another. They all shared and took care of one another. You see, James telling us, once again though, because this grumbling can destroy the unity you guys, are you guys picking up on that theme? The unity? Like that, that's the thing, is the unity. I kept seeing as I was studying this as well. Galatians 5, 13 through 15 talks about personal attacks. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Everybody say serve one another. Serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you will not be consumed by one another. You know, there's a, there's a quote uh, by Jack Hayford. It says this, Christian freedom is not the removal of moral restraints, but instead the freedom to serve one another. The gospel exchanges the oppressive bondage of legalism for the higher bondage of love. Think about that. It's, I don't act a certain way or, or run my mouth or, or tear you down just because it's not the outsiders. 
these, these scriptures weren't written to people who didn't believe. They were written to the church. It shows me that it's a continual process of minding my behavior and minding how I treat one another. And it's always, it's always there, and it's a constant where we should pause daily, regularly, whatever. I hesitate to say anything daily because if you have any amount of children uh, or any amount of workload on you, you know that, dude, the day can completely change in a second, okay? But this is what it should be, is let's be regular about it. This should be a constant in our lives, okay? Like, we should engage Scripture regularly. Would I love it if it was daily? Oh, my gosh, yeah, man. You know why? Because when I engage Scripture daily, I am refreshed and I'm renewed. My mind is renewed to be like Christ. But do I recognize and and realize that some days may start at 5 a.m. for some of you, some of you at 2 a.m., some of you may run from 2 a.m. until 10, 11, and it's like jam-packed, and you're like, dude, I have no time to, like, sit and open my word and, like, you know, the doves are hovering around me and, you know, the Holy Spirit's just there hanging out with a cup of coffee, you know. I think, first of all, it's important to reframe that, okay, is not everyone is able to do that, okay? Not everyone's schedule will allow for you to have the, uh, there's a movie, War Room, is that it, I think, maybe? I don't know, close your closet door and pray. Okay, not everyone's schedule will allow that. But what it does allow for some of us is to turn the cab of our truck into, uh, into our Bible study, into our own devotional time, okay? You can pull out version, download it. You can play any, is my mic back? I felt that. I'm so sorry I was yelling at you. <laughs> you can download version. And you can listen to the word as you drive, okay? If you struggle, and, and the reason why I'm saying this is because uh, we have students who this is, a, this is a struggle, okay? If you struggle to read, I just, I can't stand reading, okay? I don't know what it is. I don't understand it. The words don't make sense. Some of you may have, like, uh, actual, like, dyslexic situation where the letters start jumping off the page. That's cool there's still a way for you to learn. There's still a way for you to grow. You click on you version and let someone else read it to you. Follow along the scripture as, as you version reads it to you. You guys hear me? So don't allow yourself to fall into the, 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 the lie that I'm too busy. I've got too many things going on. I just, I can't. Because I think a lot of us have like really poor excuses. Like I can't. And I'm not saying, like, you have poor excuses. I'm saying I've got poor excuses, too. We're all in the same boat here, okay? The key, though, is that it's a regular thing. Because the re- that what we're going to get to at the end of this is that we have to have that. Like, that's, that's a requirement for us to be able to live a successful Christ-following life. How else would you know someone if you never, if you never spend any time with them? Right? Like, like, how many of your marriages would be really good if you never talked to each other, if you never went and ate dinner together, if you never spent any time together without kids, okay? If you never spent any time together, how good would your marriage be? It probably wouldn't be really good. It probably wouldn't be really good. So to say I'm a Christian that doesn't read my Bible that doesn't equate, bro. You may, you may think that, okay? You may think that. But you are completely deceived. Because if I'm married, but I never talk, I never come home, I never spend any time with my wife, yeah, I may be legally married, but my marriage is really unhealthy. You guys hear me? Just like our walk with Christ is, man, we should want to spend time with him. We should want to read the word. We should want to. That's something that, man, I desire that. Lord, speak to me today. Show me how I can reflect your kingdom best. Okay? So let's dive in to Philippians 2, 3 through 4. 
says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in, humanity, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. There's a, there's a Christian artist, I can't remember his name, uh, what, it, what his actual name is, but he does an uh, animated show, or a, a puppet show called Slugs and Bugs. Anyone out there? No? Maybe I'm the only one. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Um, it's not the first time I've been here today, so. Um, he also writes a, a song called Cheese Dip, Cheese Dip, Cheese Dip. Starts out like that. Chips and salsa. Okay. It's pretty cool. Uh, look it up. Slugs and bugs later if you want. It's okay. Uh, this is what happens when the next-gen pastor preaches and power drops out. So uh, <laughs> uh, I start to freak out. Dad, where are you? <laughs> Uh, but but he, he actually takes scripture and puts it to uh, song form for kids, okay? So it's, uh, um, it starts out kind of like this. Uh, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, count others above yourself, okay? Something like that. Don't, don't, don't quote me on the lyrics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for that. Appreciate that. Thanks for, the, thanks for the help there. But this is what it is. This is what spiritual maturity is. And I think the, 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 the older generation understands this. And, and I find myself, like, desiring the Lord to do this work in me. But spiritual maturity is others before me. Others before me, that's maturity. It's saying, you know what? man, I know that I've got the freedom to say this, to do this, but because of where they are, I need to hold back. I need to just let this go and let the Lord use me to lead them closer to him. Do you guys hear me? And and once again, we're writing, these verses are coming to us in the church, within the church. So this gets played out amongst us. Okay, yeah, you've got the right, you've got the freedom, man. Praise God, we were set free from legalism. But is it what's best? Galatians 5.26. To the believers in Galatia, once again, we're writing, writing to the believers. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Remember, this is, this is right at the tail end of the, the fruit of the Spirit, okay? The fruit of the Spirit. Remembering that the Spirit does the work in us. So what are you doing to produce the fruit of the Spirit? Nothing. Little to nothing. What we do do, <laughs> sorry, what we do... <laughs> What we do is we place ourselves where the Lord can work on us. We place us ourselves in positions where the Holy Spirit can do his work in our life. It's like, Lord, man, I'm feeling really jealous about this person. I don't know why I'm struggling with this, but God, would you just rip it out? Lord, would I just submit myself to you? If you got to do heart surgery, do heart surgery, Lord. If you need to remove something in my life, Lord, remove it. Whatever it takes to pull out this anger, jealousy, bitterness, slanderous, lying mouth, whatever the situation is, we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit's leading. And this is getting to the root issue. Church disunity and dissension, most of the time, comes from selfishness. It comes from selfishness. Remember the question that we opened up with? What causes fights and quarrels among you? That wasn't just, man, Jeremy's really slick with the keyboard. No, that was from James. So let's turn there to James chapter four. Students, you've got the the page numbers on your, many of you already have an open gold star. Way to go, kids. James four writes this. What causes 
quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot, cont- cannot, cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Most conflicts and disputes within the church, within the believers, I have found have been brought on by something that, that experts call the Frank Sinatra syndrome. They want it their way. They want to do it their way. Why would we do it that way? That's not the way I want to do it. That's not what I want to do. Do you guys see the, the recurring issue here? It's not a Jesus-centered life. It's an I-centered life. It's about you. That's the, that's the hardest piece of this. It's the hardest piece of it is that you've got to say this to yourself. Whenever there's a conflict, whenever there's an issue, whenever something rises up, whenever someone zips in and takes the last close spot in this massive, amazing parking lot that we've been blessed with, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. Say it with me. It's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about what I desire. It's not about what I think is best. Because the Lord didn't put me in the position to make that call, to lead it that way, to do this. The Lord put me here to serve and to love. And it's not about what I think is best or what I prefer. It's about what the Lord leads me to do to serve our body. And to serve the person sitting next to me to serve my house, to serve my children. That's the realization. So many times, once again, we're dealing with conflict within the body, within the church. It's not about you. And if you've been here for so long, you're like, I've been here for 20 years. Don't you know who I am? You should be the lowest. Because Jesus, what did he say? If you want to be great, you'll serve. If you want to be the greatest, you'll be the lowest. He, just before crucifixion, what's he do? He takes a towel and wraps it around his waist and washes the feet of the disciples, who he is now giving this mission, giving this gospel to. He showed us what greatness is. And greatness is saying, you know what? I know that I'm the son of God. And I know that in a moment's notice, I could call angels down and they would kill these soldiers. They would take me off this cross. But instead he said, it's not about me. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. Man, at the root, this typically reflects in the desire for personal recognition or honor or power, or pleasure, or money, or superiority. Satisfying selfish desires becomes more important than doing what is right and serving God's desires and purposes, more important than preferring one another, more important than the Great Commission. It's demonic, and it has the spirit of Antichrist all over it. John MacArthur said it best. What the Lord laments and opposes, Satan applauds and fosters. Few things demoralize, discourage, and weaken a church as much as bickering, backbiting, and fighting among its members. Because of quarreling, the father is dishonored, the son is disgraced, his people are demoralized and discredited, and the world is turned off and confirmed in unbelief. Listen, this is the piece. This right here hits, as the kids say. Fractured fellowship robs the Christian of joy and effectiveness, robs God of glory, and robs the world of the true testimony of the gospel. It's a high price for an ego trip. Think about it, church. And what James is telling these believers is, listen, people are watching you. People are seeing how you treat each other. 
instead of fighting one another, instead of tearing each other down, instead of backbiting and gossiping and running your mouth, instead of celebrating the failure of, of one another, man, love one another. Love's highest call is to say, hey, you know what? It's not about me. It's about what you need. What can I do to help you? What can I do to serve you? What can I do to help you grow closer to Jesus today? This is our sin nature, man. Like this is, the, what we're talking about is not something that you had to learn. Right next to dad, dad, and mama was mine. Right? Like, no, mine. It's something that we have been innately given because we're human, you were human. Because of our fallen humanity, we have this sin nature. Following Jesus should produce humility in us, which is the opposite of selfishness. Band, if you want to come up, and I don't know if we can get that going. Self-centeredness is the essence of worldliness. Have you been on social media? Have you seen it? Listen, not all social media is bad, but I'm going to be honest. I think maybe like 2% is good, okay? It's, there's not much of any worth on there. Because the thing is, no one's really showing you their true self on social media. It's always the highlight reel. That's why we feel so bad, like, oh, my kid's birthday party doesn't look like that. Well, yeah, what you don't know is they chose not to pay the light bill that month. You know what I'm saying? Like, Social media and the comparison game that is played on that has been detrimental. Detrimental to our society. What is, what is displayed is all about me. It's selfishness and I. Look at what I did. Look at who I, look at where I'm at. Look at what I'm doing today. Now listen, I'm not like, oh man, he's gonna be watching us while we post. I don't care what you post. I really don't. I love you. How can I serve you? I post stuff too. I commented on a friend who said, as a Notre Dame fan, I'm pretty sure that Florida State would beat us. And I said, as a Miami Hurricanes fan, I happen to agree. So I understand there is a piece of social media that's fun. This is what we have to realize and recognize. That in that list of don't lie and don't slander and don't gossip and don't backbite, and there's one I didn't even throw on there, was watch your mouth. Like you'll be held, you're, you need to be careful for the careless word you say. There's no way that Jeremy White in who I am, or Jeremiah David White, if you're Mrs. Lefevers, can meet that list. I'm incapable. I find myself overdrawn in my spiritual ability. What I have to recognize is that the Holy Spirit is the only way for me to make this happen. That I need him. I don't have the capacity or the ability to meet this call to love my neighbor as myself, to put someone else's needs above my own. The only way to conquer the flesh is to yield to the Spirit. And I only wrote like one action point for you today. One, one piece. If you missed all of this, take this away. That we have to walk by the Spirit. We have to walk by the Spirit. Paul wasn't just using really good language or a catchy title. It's the only way that we can make this work. It's the only way that we can love one another, that we can serve one another, that we can encourage one another properly. It's the only way that we can put ourselves last is that we walk by the Spirit. Because when I walk by the Spirit, I trust, you know what? The Lord sees me and the Lord knows me. And the Lord knows my need and I know that the Lord is gonna meet that need whenever that happens. It's not on me to force a door open, to push something to make it happen. It's not on me. The Lord sees me and knows me. I can rest in Him. And I can rest in his faithfulness. Let's turn to Galatians 5. I can't, 
I can't miss this this part of scripture. It says 522 but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. See, Paul focused on many issues within the church in Galatia. But there's one constant that keeps coming up. And as you look through chapter 5, you see in verse 16, he says to walk by the Spirit. In verse 18, he says, be led by the Spirit. In verse 25, he once again says, live by the Spirit. He explained that if we would, well, he was convinced of this, that if we would walk by the Spirit, step by step, they could solve any attitude problem in the church. They could solve any dispute within the church that if they would just walk by the Spirit. That, that term, the, the language is keep in step with the Spirit. I'm not going to try to say the Greek word because I'm going to butcher it. But it means, it, it shows the picture of to follow the leader. Is As soon as I start to walk, I'm following every step. Every step, I'm following him. Lord, I need your help with parenting. God, I don't know what to do with this situation. Lord, help me see what's the right choice to make. God, I don't know how to handle this situation at work. God, I need your wisdom. I need your guidance. Holy Spirit, show me what the next step to make is with my marriage. Lord, I, I want to honor you. I want to reflect the kingdom values in my marriage. See, it's not like, hey, let me take control. It's like following him step by step. Walking by the Spirit implies both direction and empowerment that not only am I going to follow Him, but He's going to give me the power and what I need to get there. He's going to give me what I need to get there, that I have to trust that He is faithful and that He is going to help me take that next step to do what He's asked me to do. This is with everything, man. This is an ongoing situation. Remember when I talked about regular engagement of Scripture? This is something that we should regularly do. We should humbly recognize our dependency on the Holy Spirit. This isn't just like, hey, you need a pencil for school. Let me throw it in my backpack. No, this is like, hey, I need the breath in my lungs to get out of bed in the morning. Holy Spirit, I need you to be the husband and the father that you called me to be. Holy Spirit, I need you to be the mother, to the wife, to the co-worker. I, we need the Holy Spirit, church. That's the only way this thing works. Where do I go, Holy Spirit? What do I do? What do you want in me? Teach me. Help me, Holy Spirit. He will. He's faithful. If you ask him, he will teach you. He will show you what to do. passages have dealt with with behavior within the church with unity within the church and what I want us to do is I want us to join together in unison as we just sing we're just going to worship the worship God we're going to Nancy's going to lead us in this chorus and then I'm going to pray and then we're going to be dismissed but it's something because I didn't want to just say, hey, come up here to the altar. Like I felt, I felt the altar for you needs to be at your car. It needs to be at the, at the kitchen sink. It needs to be at your bedside. This is not a one-time altar call we need to have. This is an altar call every day. Holy Spirit, help me. God, give me the strength I need to please you. God, give me the, the strength to shut my mouth when I want to run it. This needs to be a regular altar call for us, church. We need to regularly humble ourselves and ask.
for himself.